Greetings from Camino Lutheran Church on this 21st Sunday in the season of Pentecost. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We continue our worship together with the confession and, as always, receiving God's forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Sovereign God, you turn your greatness into goodness for all the peoples on earth. Shape us into willing servants of your kingdom, and make us desire always and only your will, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. Amen. first lesson will be from Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 12. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he has wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. 
like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. We, who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken from the transgressions of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession with the transgressors. Word of hope, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Hebrews 5, verses 1 through 10. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he has heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, 
and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Word of hope, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our Gospel reading for the 21st Sunday in the season of Pentecost comes from the 10th chapter of Mark, beginning with the 35th verse. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which am I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left hand is not mine to grant but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they became angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among you the Gentiles, whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must become your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Word of hope, word of life. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, bless the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart. They are pleasing to you and faithful to your gospel. This I pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you were at our in-person service this week, you would see our bulletin cover. I'm going to try to show that to you. Uh, hopefully it shows up. All we like sheep have gone astray. It's the text from Isaiah, one of the verses from Isaiah. And I saw that picture of the sheep and it made me chuckle because it looks like it's looking to see either where did everybody go or some sense of is somebody coming after me what's 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 going on here and when we think about the scriptures and these difficult texts we've had for for the uh, last couple of weeks and that come up at different times the fact is we are all like sheep we've gone gone astray in one form or another and of course what is the reality of sheep who've gone astray jesus talks about it you leave the other 99 and he goes and he gets the one. That's what the good shepherd does. And he takes that one that's lost, that's wondering, uh, maybe like this one was on here. And what does he do? He rejoices, number one, that he found the, the lost sheep, the one that's gone astray, but puts him on his shoulder and rejoices coming back that he's found the one and brings the sheep back into the flock, back into the herd, back into the place where they belong, where they're all together. And as we take a look at our gospel reading for today, I think there's some real depth of the importance of connecting with our community, connecting with people on just a basic human level of being connected and how important that is. Last week, we had the, the text of the, the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, you know, I've done all the things, the commandments, all of that. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus smiles at him, loves him, and says, I, one thing, you lack one thing. One thing you need to let go of, get rid of all you have, give it to the poor and come and follow me. And of course we heard he walks away sad and it was tough for him. His whole world was getting turned upside down. As I mentioned last week, he liked his position of power, his position of privilege, if you will, in one form or another, I'm assuming. And we talked about last week, the idea is he was taking kind of that with him into this new age that he believed was supposed to come with the Messiah, and that would keep him maintaining in a place that was above and over others. And when it comes to wealth, we, we, we need money. I mean, money takes care of us in so many different ways. Um, 
it provides our food, it provides our shelter, it provides our clothing, it provides us a way to do business with one another. There's lots of good things um, in, in terms of how we use our, our finances. It gives us the opportunity to share and to give to others. But it also has a chance to uh, put us in a position of power, put us in a position where we're in control over others, maybe when we don't even realize it. I mean, you can see how often that, that money, wealth can separate us out. I mean, just look at the different places that we live. You live in communities that represent some level, usually, of your finances. And then you can look at one community and have some sense of, of what the finances are there and who people are there. You can look at a different community and you have your assumptions, stereotypes, whatever it might be in, in that particular area. And so while wealth so often separates us, it can separate us in a way that it keeps us apart. And I didn't realize how much of effect it can have even within the, the church community on a daily basis until in a congregation I was serving, it was a wealthy congregation, um, very active, did all kinds of things, constantly having events and things that you could come to. But it wasn't until one of our members, who was a, a single mom, working hard at a, a nonprofit that was a gift and blessing in the community, which meant, as you could probably assume, she didn't make very much money. And yet, a part of this wealthy congregation that did so much all the time, and she finally had shared one day of how difficult that is, because so many of the things cost money, and where for so many others, it was easy to just give and, and, and do it. It wasn't for her. Um, she just didn't have it. And even though the community knew it and she said it had been very gracious to her over the years, it still had this tension that was there for her. Because even when people continue to give you something, you're in that spot of feeling like others have something over you. You're always indebted to them. Or that you constantly have to go and to ask and say and remind, hey, I can't do all these things. So we see the difficulty that this guy was having in that story, that it was gonna take away that position for him of some, some privilege or having some sense of control, even, even over other folks. Power and control, it finds ourselves, it's, it's way into our lives all the time. As I was reflecting on this text for this week from the gospel reading, uh, devotion came in for me from God Paused from Luther Seminary, and it was written by David Shear, and it's on this text. And this is what he writes. On January 26, 1966, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. moved his entire family from their nice size home in Atlanta to a small third floor apartment in the North Lawndale community in Chicago. Many people were confused by this decision. North Lawndale was a community ravaged by poverty and the effects of virulent, virulent racism in the North. People couldn't understand why King, one of the preeminent leaders in the country, would choose to live there in such simple conditions. King knew that it would be difficult to transform suffering that he himself was not willing to assume. This kind of self-giving love was very peculiar to a world that wanted to hang on to its power and privilege. Dr. King was participating in what Eric Law calls the cycle of gospel living. The cycle is about living to serve, not to be served, seeking to lose our life and in turn have it found, etc. May each of us find ways to participate in this cycle today as we seek to love boldly with a selfless peculiarity that confounds a world seeking power at all costs. So Dr. King was willing to immerse himself into the community, particularly those who were struggling would appear to be the most, particularly at that time and that place. He was willing to be in relationship with them. Now today's text in conversations about power or control isn't always about money and finances. I just wanted to tie that back to last week and then raise our awareness to the reality of what it plays in our everyday life when we talk about uh, money and its challenges that it can present. But if you take a look at our text for today, we see that power and control find their way in, not around finances, but about positioning and about status. Our gospel reading opens up. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they come to Jesus, and I, I wish I knew for sure the inflection that they had. They say to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. To me, it has that sense of, we want you to do whatever we, ever we want. 
it's like they're putting it to Jesus. This is what you're going to do. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but there seems to be some level to that. Jesus is like, okay, what do you want? And they say, well, we want you to grant one of us to sit at your right hand and one at the left. Now, what have they just done? They want to be in the high seats, the positions of power, the place where everybody's looking. And of course, as we keep talking about what their thoughts were on a Messiah who was to come to bring power and restore the, 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 the Jewish community back to their positions of power and privilege in the, in the community, um, they're asking this. And Jesus is like, well, okay, let me ask you some things. Can you, can you be involved in the baptism I'm involved in? Sure we can. And yes, we think about baptism. What is it? It's the gift that God pours out on us, where God claims us as God's child, as God's own to hold us, offering, washing our sins, forgiving us, and then pouring out God's spirit to give us gifts to be this blessing in the world so that we have purpose and guidance and direction on how to be in relationship with one another. And we each know we have a valued gift given by God to share in the world. And then he says, are you able to drink the cup from which I am to drink? And of course for us, this might bring up images of communion. And if we think about it in that way, communion, what is it? It's this incredible gift of God again for us that we come before God open hands and we receive the gift of in Christ's body and blood, bread and wine, God's forgiveness, God's gift of sustaining us in life and promising us, promising us in the receiving of this gift that we are held in God's care from now and through all eternity. Those are things that come as gifts from outside, from God. And then it gets interesting. There's this turn. There's this turn. So we can see, we can see what was the intentions and behind in the heart of the disciples saying that. What do the other disciples say? Think about it. They were asking for those two, two positions. Who cares about our, our friends here that we've been hanging out with every day? We want the top spot. And what do his friends do? Well, they do the same thing. They get mad at him. And my sense is it's a self-righteous anger. How dare you do that? But knowing human beings and human condition as we are, I don't know that that was all pure and they're getting back at the disciples, it, getting angry with them. Sure, they could call them out for it, but I bet there were some pieces, how dare you try to jump in front of us and take our position that we wanted. And here's where Jesus continues this constant flipping of the story of who they are called to be as his disciples living out their faith in the world. He heard this, he began to be, they began to be angry. And Jesus says, you know that among you, the Gentile leaders, what do they do? They lord it over their people. It's what people who get power and, and control over others will often do. And then he juxtaposes that and he comes back and he says, but that's not so, that's not what I want among you. It's not what I'm about. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He's calling them not to the positions of power to where they can have control over others. And they think that'll be the way to get it all right. No, he's calling them to be in relationships with people, to be connected with them where they are. That success isn't something that necessarily can be measured but is something that we see within the connection of human beings caring for one another. I mean, think about Jesus' story. He didn't run away um, from hatred. He went to it. He went to Samaria, a place where Jews and Samaritans hated each other and tried to avoid each other at all costs. He went into that place. He, when he saw pain and suffering, he didn't go away from it. He went from town to town. He went to visit. The, the sick, the, the lepers that came. And that's the thing. And then the people that came towards him, he didn't run from them. He stayed connected with them and engaged them. The lepers that came to him, the demoniac that comes out of the tombs, the, the, the paralytic that is let down through the roof, just praying to get connected with Jesus. Jesus doesn't disconnect from people. He doesn't try to separate like a lost sheep is gonna stay on his own. He realizes the importance of being connected just on a basic human level with others, because there we get the chance to serve. Now, many of you are aware, as I close here, that we are connected with the uh, OPOP, 
which is one prisoner, uh, one parish, one prisoner program, and we are in relationship now with uh, our our our, um, our friend Kelly, uh, who will be getting out in about eight months. And so what we've been doing is letter writing, just getting to know one another. And they keep reminding us over and over again, this isn't about fixing Kelly. This isn't about making Kelly what we want Kelly to be. This isn't about everything going perfect and right. It's just about relationship. It's about being connected. That's the heart of servanthood, being willing to be connected with another, to admit our own mistakes and our own imperfections and to hear his and to share in that together, to rejoice in the things that bring joy and life. And we're continuing to build this relationship, not just for now, but for a lifetime, that we can continue that, that, that connection and relationship um, for a lifetime. That's not how we measure success often in society. Most would say, well, what's the success outcome for the program? It has to be this. And they keep reminding us, no, it's just relationship and being connected. Because sometimes that's the most difficult. Like I said, Jesus didn't go away. He went too. And when they came, he stayed with them. And so as part of one of our um, modules that we were, we were reading and learning from, there was a, a section from a book by uh, Greg Boyle, Father Greg Boyle, who's the founder of Homeboy Ministries, working with uh, gang members down in the um, down in Los Angeles area, I believe. And um, the book is called Tattoos on the Heart. And this is what he writes. The American poet Jack Gilbert writes, the pregnant heart is driven to hopes that are the wrong size for this world, end quote. The strategy and stance of Jesus was consistent in what it was always in that it was always out of step with the world. Jesus defied all the categories upon which the world insisted. Good, evil, success, failure, pure, impure. Surely he was an equal opportunity, these are his words, pisser offer in this regard. The right wing would stare at him and question where he chose to stand. They hated that he aligned himself with the unclean, those outside, those folks you ought neither to touch nor be near. He hobnobbed with the leper, shared table fellowship with the sinner. He rendered himself ritually impure in the process. They found it offensive that to boot, Jesus had no regard for their wedge issues, their constitutional amendments or their cultural culture wars. The left was equally annoyed. They wanted to see the 10 point plan, the revolution in high gear, the toppling of the sinful social structures. They were impatient with his brand of solidarity. They wanted to see him taking the right stand on issues, not just standing in the right place. But Jesus stood with the outcast. The left screamed, don't just stand there, do something. And the right maintained, don't stand with those folks at all. Both sides, seeing Jesus as the wrong size for this world, came to their own reasons for wanting him dead. Both sides were equally impressed as he unrolled the scroll and spoke of, good news to the poor, sight to the blind, liberty to captives. Yet only a handful of verses later, they wanted to throw Jesus over a cliff. How do we get the world to change anyway? Dorothy Day asked critically, where were the saints to try and change the social order, not just minister to the slaves, but to do away with slavery? Dorothy Day is a hero of mine, but I disagree with her here. You actually abolish slavery by accompanying the slave. We don't strategize our way out of slavery. We solidarize, if you will, our way toward its demise. We stand in solidarity with the slave. And by doing so, we diminish slavery ability to stand. By casting our lot with the gang member, we hasten the demise of demonizing. All Jesus asks is, where are you standing? And after chilling defeat and soul numbing failure, he asks again, are you still standing there? Can we stay faithful and persistent in our fidelity, even when things seem not to succeed? I suppose Jesus could have chosen a strategy that worked better, evidence-based outcomes that didn't end in the cross, but he couldn't find a strategy more soaked with fidelity than the one that he embraced. All like sheep have gone astray. The disciple literally meaning students were learners and they were learning and we are disciples lifelong learners 
the challenging part comes in hearing Jesus' words as we see the reality reflected in life, both in the devotion from God Paz and from Greg Boyle and Homeboy Ministries, is the apostleship part, when we are actually sent out to live it. So we ask for God's grace and, and help in doing that. Let us pray. Gracious God, help me to journey beyond the familiar and comfortable into the unknown and at times uncomfortable places where you reside and invite us to come. For the sake of our brothers and sisters created in your image and for the sake of our own selves to live in the fullness of life found in you. Keep calling us out and keep journeying with us. Set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all of God's creation. Holy One, for the gift of the church handed down through the ages and for all who carry on the servant ministry of Jesus, we praise you. Send your Holy Spirit upon all who are discerning calls to ministry in its many forms and equip them with your gifts, Lord, in your mercy hear our prayer. Creating one for the lush and abundant habitat you provide for all your creatures, we praise you. Provide healing for the earth so that waterfowl, reptiles, wild horses, dolphins, and all living things flourish as you intend. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Suffering one for all who work toward peace and who lead nations with servants' hearts, we praise you. Bring justice for all who suffer violence, persecution, discrimination, hunger, poverty, and homelessness, and create places of refuge for all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful one, for all who do the work of healing in mind, body, and spirit, we praise you. Surround and comfort all who struggle with depression, anxiety, cancer, diabetes, dementia, or any illness that may be healed. Marilyn Hickok, Pam Larson, Sharon and Dave Sterlick, Bill Silo, Ben and Kaylee, and Nicole Bingay. We also remember those written in our bulletin. Our prayers 
lists and those we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts at this time. That all may be healed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain you one. For all who volunteer for the vitality of this congregation, we praise you. Strengthen and encourage greeters, ushers, office volunteers, bakers, counters, committee and group leaders, teachers, students, evangelists, singers, builders, nurturers, and all who serve with generous hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Confident that you hear us, O God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. God of abundance, you cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts that you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world that you so dearly love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, we pray. Amen. As you head into your week, servants as Christ has called us to serve, may Almighty God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. The living word dwells in you. Thanks be to God. Greetings for our announcements from near the deck. A little cloudy and rainy out there today, so we're inside. But a few announcements. Benevolence of the Month, Lutheran World Relief wonderful work that they do around the world. Of course, our quilters are tied within that, between the quilting and the care kits and all that they do. Um, when the, the explosion happened in Lebanon, our group got together, Lutheran Road Relief, Lutheran Disaster Relief, those groups connected together. So um, if you'd like to give a little extra to that benevolence of the month, please put that memo in your check when you send it in. We'll make sure it gets there, or you can donate online as well. And then speaking of the world um, and some of the realities we're facing, we of course have the refugee crisis out of Afghanistan. And many of you have asked, is the Lutheran Church uh, involved in this in any way in terms of helping out? And we are gonna have an event on November 7th, which is a Sunday at 7 p.m. It'll be on Zoom because our speaker um, does not live in the area, but we're gonna have the executive director of Lutheran Community Services Northwest is going to be with us, Salah Ansari, and he is a refugee from Afghanistan from years ago when he was a young boy, um, and he's going to give us information and update on what's been happening and, and ways in which we might be involved either in the immediate or in the long term as they're getting all the pieces figured out. So if you'd like to be involved in that and you're not already on the All Church email, that's where we'll send out the link please call the office 360-629-4592 or you can email Sarah Lynn at um, Kameno, CLC at wavecable.com and let her know you'd like to be a part of that and she'll add you to the email when the link goes out to, to everyone. I um, was talking to Marilyn Smith the other day and while you're watching this online, maybe you do also come to the in-person worship. Uh, they're looking for, for extra help at this point. We've got a small group that has been great in terms of willing to, to read or usher or help out with um, communion setup and altar setup, but we could definitely use some more. So if you can help out with that, please contact the office or contact Marilyn Smith and let her know. And then last, last but not least, I wanted to let you know just again that the memorial service for Leif Larson will be on November 20th at 11.30 at Camino Lutheran Church with uh, reception of food to follow over at the Camino Center. So hope you can come 
and be a part of that. God's peace and blessings to you on your week.